So it's definitely tailored and catered towards a very specific audience that might not know a lot of keywords. I want to like, um, the first thing that I'm thinking of, and when Tim was explaining this to me a couple of days ago, I, I thought of like a stash or Robin hood or something like that for real estate. I, I think historically people have looked at, um, investing in a business as either the stock market or you have to be an accredited investor accredited investor someone who i think at this time is worth like 300 grand or something like that so, a million in net worth or yeah. if, it's about 200 200 thousand uh if you're a single individual, individual 300 as married yes like and then yeah. a million dollars worth of asset that's not including your your home uh, so in where it but real estate isn't the same as that Right. So like to buy a house, you don't have to be an accredited investor. You just have to go through, you know, a ridiculous amount of paperwork. So you guys said accredited investor, though, in that. Why couldn't anyone just invest in in real estate because it's too much money and because you can buy it from a fractional standpoint like a stash? Is that is that the big play here? Yes, sir. Chris, did you want to elaborate? So essentially, I, I mean, what, what we're doing is taking it and we're making it. Uh, significantly more affordable. So, I mean, when we look, what we're thinking of, of, of our more direct competitors would be a fundraise or uh, something where there's going to be a higher cost to entry. What we're trying to do is really uh, eliminate that, that cost as a barrier of entry. We're trying to give uh, uh, people the freedom to fail in real estate investing. To be frank with you, that was kind of a lot of the, uh, the mentality that at least kind of inspired me when Stan came to me with the, with the, with the pocket properties idea. Um, it, it's just because, uh, you know, with real estate, like you said, there's kind of, there's leaps and bounds that you have to go through in order to I actually uh, buy a property. Uh, you know, typically you're going to have to have anywhere between three to $10,000. Um, that is not much freedom to fail. You're going to have to take out a loan. Um, whereas with a stock, um, you know, very minimal investment. I can, I can, I can lose five dollars. I can lose ten dollars, and I can gain a wealth of experience and knowledge along the way. Um, so that that was kind of our thinking with that. If that if that kind of helped answer the question a little bit. Yeah, I mean, it's just uh, from instead of having to put down 10% on a, a couple thousand dollar house just to get a mortgage and then you're responsible for that mortgage, you can just purchase however many shares you want. And, uh, and then you can diversify amongst multiple properties as opposed to uh, putting all your eggs in one basket. Exactly. Exactly. And you can also diversify, uh, you can tailor your returns as well too. So you're not stuck to a fund that's giving you a, a set percentage. Uh, I can invest in this property, which is yielding this much return. I can invest in this property, which is yielding this much return. Uh, yeah. So it's a lot more control as well too. Yeah. How long have you guys been at, uh, been working on this business? Um, so I want to say it was the, the idea first hit, you know, hit paper in uh, early August. Um, no, really not like, I'm good. Okay. So yeah. for like seven years. I was, <laughs> don't ever say yeah. <laughs> okay. No, no. So, uh, we, we came up with the idea back in early August. Um, really September was kind of the, um, uh, Chris and I, we wholesaled together for about a year and a half, which for those of you who don't know, it's kind of middle manning, uh, real estate investing, mm -hmm. um, contracts. Uh, so we were doing that full time uh, before this. And back in around September, we decided, hey, let's let's put all of our focus on on a pocket properties. We think we have something that, you know, could help, uh, you know, help a lot of people and create a new industry. Yeah. And then we we delved. I would say we we full stopped in uh, in January, like our first post on the uh, on the pocket properties Instagram page. I believe it was like January 7th was uh, when we just, you know, full stopped wholesaling. Um, and at that point it kind of made sense just based on the amount of traction that we were getting from our friends and family, uh, from our, our direct marketing campaign. Cause I mean, you know, I've started, started, started and failed businesses before, uh, you know, so when you see the type of traction that you get from your friends and family, uh, like at this point they're, 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 uh, they're harsh judges and very real judges of my business, which is good. I want that. Um, really? You find really, that's interesting. So I found the exact opposite, <laughs> right? So like, I find that like, I call it the mom effect where your friends and family are always going to be like way too positive and they're a terrible indicator. So it's interesting that you have taken this and said that they were a good indicator of moving forward in something like, I almost think that you should never get friends and family to buy, or at least 
make a huge decision off of because they're you, they're so tied to you that they want to see you succeed, which is great. Take all their money. I'm not saying that, <laughs> but I think from a business perspective, a lot of times they can provide you really misleading data points. And it's interesting that you've taken the opposite effect and, and it seems to be in a positive swing. Which right. is tip, typically you're, you're exactly right. The, the reason why I say they're, they're, they're good and harsh judges now is because I've, I've failed. They've watched me fail publicly with multiple businesses before. Hmm. So, at, you know, at this, you know, it's a, uh, it's a thing as a young entrepreneur, when you start businesses, you know, you fail, you, you know, you start and you fail. So with the first one, I, 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 I felt all the fake support in the world. Uh, with the second one, you know, you see, you see it kind of dwindle. And then with the, you know, so we, by the end of it, you're realizing when I come to people, they're going to give me their real reaction now. So at this point, um, seeing the traction that we were able to build with our friends and family, it was not, it was not typical. Um, also, you know, just the follow up questions and stuff like that. But no, you're exactly right. Traditionally, friends and family, horrible judges. <laughs> what, uh, what you learn most from? Did you ever learn more from your wins or more from your losses? More from, I'll, I'll say um, both. Uh, it's, it's, it's kind of a, you know, a political answer, but I'll say, <laughs> <laughs> I definitely would say both. Um, you know, when you fail, you learn a lesson and you learn it very quickly. Um, you do learn, you know when you fa- do you know when you're failing? Not all the time, mm-hmm. not all the time. Sometimes it has to blow up in your face for you to realize, Hey, this was not a good idea. Um, and once again, Chris and I, we, we've started three businesses together. And uh, one of them was one of those situations where it blew up in our face and we were like, that was a dumb idea. Um, <laughs> so what was it? Was it the so uh, we, stuff? So we did a, um, a digital distribution and artist, man- artist management company. Um, so essentially we managed hip hop artists out of Richmond. Um, so, you know, first off, artists don't want to uh, pay money. And second is it's Richmond. Um, it's not Atlanta. Yeah. <laughs> it's not Atlanta. It's not LA. It's not Miami. Um, y- yeah, we do not have a. It's not. There's not a very popping uh, club or music scene here to to push the music as well. So it's there's a. Uh, you know, we we kind of realized it, it was not necessarily the place for that this industry, and then also the amount of time and, and energy that it would. It's, it's not not necessarily worth it. Interesting. So not not to touch on that a lot, but I think it could be really, really important. So you, you realize that the market that you were in from that old business was the wrong market and it, it just it just didn't work. How do you how do you recognize not necessarily that that was the case back then, but like with this new business that the market that you're in now or the markets that you're trying to explore and get in? are the right right market to actually see this thing hit because it sounds like if you were doing uh that business in an atlanta la maybe even a nashville type of thing you know music century uh music centric areas they could work but right. how do you know that you know i mean to me richmond virginia right you know uh the 757 804 you know those are not areas that i think of as real estate central why do you th- how do you know that this is going to work from from a from a just operational standpoint and not do it in a big city where there could be a lot more opportunities. Well, to be honest with you, where we're exploring investment options, we're, we're not necessarily, uh, our initial investment options aren't necessarily going to be in, uh, in Virginia. Um, however, when it came to actually um, kind of recognizing that this was something that was, uh, you know, that this recognizing that this is a business that, you know, this, this, the market is there for it. I mean, it, it's all kind of, it's, it's traction based in the fact of, you know, we're, we're looking at our competitors in the market. Um, we're looking at just, you know, if you look at NFTs, the way decentralized finance is going, uh, period, real estate is really the next industry that's uh, prime for kind of massive disruption. Um, but we, we aren't and to kind of hone back in. We're, we're not necessarily focused on just investing in Virginia or Richmond or um, like, you know, 757 area. Um, our initial uh, acquisition strategy is, is that so that we can we can actually tokenize properties pretty much anywhere. Uh, granted, we are looking to keep them in a concentrated area uh, just because it's going to give us uh, as, as a company the best return on the back end uh, because we'll have the most control over the property values in a, in a concentrated area. But um, you know, we, 
we're, we're not going to tie ourselves to a, uh, you know, kind of a secondary city, but even so secondary cities like Nashville and Richmond are, are growing nowadays. So as someone who's yeah. been directly involved within the startup community for almost a decade, I want to talk to you about a serious pain point, spending a ton of time trying to understand the business landscape in the 757. That's time that should be focused on growing the business. At Startwheel, we're here to help you by compiling all of the news you need to know about in one place. Now there's no need to search multiple websites. Just head to startwheel.org and see for yourself. That's startwheel.org.